Disturbing things had been happening on the fifth floor of the Rose Heights apartment building in Albany, New York. Residents had reported strange noises over the last few days. Screaming in the night, pained muttering, soft weeping, scratching and scuttling in the walls. And worst of all, what seemed like an infestation of bugs unlike anything the unfortunate occupants of Rose Heights had ever seen before. They weren't abnormal in size or shape, they looked an awful lot like the common earwig, around two and a half centimeters long with large curved pinchers on the back. But the color wasn't right. Unlike the usual dark brown, these earwigs were a silverly, almost translucent gray. When people spotted them crawling across their walls or hiding in the carpet, they seemed to shimmer in the light. Eventually, the building's landlady, Donna Tompkins, was called in to do something about the infestation. She spoke to each of the residents about their experience. They reported the strange noises, the mysterious bugs, and even a funny smell they'd sometimes catch in the hall. A smell like someone had thrown up. And every single person that Donna spoke to couldn't help but remark that the smell was particularly strong outside the apartment of a certain resident, Bill Parham. Stranger still was the fact that Bill hadn't been seen in days. Donna knocked on his door, but received no answer. She called him on his cell phone and could hear the phone ringing inside the apartment, but it just went to voicemail. When she checked the security footage of the lobby, she saw that Bill hadn't left the building in the last few days either. Donna called the police, worried that Bill might be sick or even dead inside his apartment. It was strange, given that he was only in his 30s and didn't seem to have any health conditions. But stranger things had happened. Much stranger things were about to happen too. Two police officers arrived not long after. They called through the door one more time, and when they got no response, Donna gave them the key to head inside. The apartment was a wreck. All the furniture was covered in dust. Filthy dishes were piled high in the sink and on the draining board. The smell of rot was thick in the air. There were empty boxes of painkillers. All the pills popped from their silvery foil laying on the ground. But worst of all were the bugs. The apartment was crawling with them, and they were on every surface. Those silvery gray earwigs. Neither of the officers liked bugs, and it seemed like the deeper they got into the apartment, the more bugs there were. Some even seemed to be crawling towards them, pointing their pinchers at them as though they were defending their territory. This looked to be a textbook case of what happens when a resident keels over and dies. But there was just one problem. Where was the body? Bill Parham had seemingly dropped off the face of the earth, and now a colony of mysterious bugs had started squatting in his apartment in his absence. Then came that smell again. That truly awful smell like bile and blood. It was even stronger now, and it seemed like it was coming from a nearby closet. The two officers acting on pure instinct drew their weapons and approached the closet with caution. Even if they weren't consciously aware of it, they knew they were going to find something awful inside. Something evil. Something dangerous. When they threw open the closet door, they couldn't help but scream. They'd found the nest. It was a huge round hive, like the biggest beehive you've ever seen melded into the lower corner of the closet. The unnatural earwigs were crawling into, out of, and around it. Thousands of them. Tens of thousands of them. And the second they registered the presence of the two officers, intruders into their nest, they began to swarm. In sheer panic, both raised their guns and opened fire into the closet, but it didn't do them any good. Their bullets just pierced and splintered the hive, causing even more enraged insects to spill out and begin crawling over the two cops. They fled from the apartment, screaming in pain from the gnashing pincers of the insects crawling all over their skin. They never did find the corpse of Bill Parham. But that's because Bill Parham wasn't dead. At least not until mere moments ago, when the bullets from the cops' gun had torn through his bones and perforated his organs. He died not long after, and if he could still speak close to the end, he would have thanked them both for the mercy. Because the monstrosity that they'd just encountered in the closet wasn't just a nest of mysterious insects in Bill Parham's apartment, it was Bill himself. 
This is the fate worse than death in store for anyone supremely unlucky enough to fall victim to SCP-439, better known by the nickname for their unique nests, the Bone Hive. And while these nasty little critters may be small, they're filled with enough pure nightmare fuel to send you running into 682's containment chamber for a little comfort. Let's go through this whole nightmarish process and tell you exactly what happened to poor Bill Parham. First discovered by the SCP Foundation in mainland China, SCP-439 specimens largely get by on the fact that they're not much to look at. Unless you're an entomologist, when you see a strange insect, you probably just accept the fact that it's a perfectly normal breed you've just never encountered before. Nobody is hammering down the doors of their local news station to alert the press about the gray earwig they saw crawling out of a crack in their bathroom wall. But if Bill Parham had done just that, it would have saved his life. The Foundation would have immediately flagged the incident as an SCP-439 infestation and dispatched a mobile task force to deal with it. Instead, when Bill saw the earwig for the first time, he was getting ready for work and didn't have the time to stop and deal with it. He made a mental note to buy some bug killer on the way home, but quickly forgot. The insect didn't forget him, though. In fact, it thought he would be a perfect candidate for the SCP-439 process. The Foundation has tested extensively with the one SCP-439 sample they'd been able to successfully catch and contain. In all tests, they found that 439 specimens rejected hosts from any species other than humans. They're an extraordinarily specific parasite. It's also only one particular type of SCP-439 specimen that you actually need to worry about. The Queens. Despite their superficial similarities, SCP-439 behave nothing like non-anomalous earwigs. Normal earwigs are not social creatures. They're solitary scavengers and they don't keep nests as permanent habitats. The same can definitely not be said for SCP-439. They have complex social structures, much like that of bees, ants, and termites, with queens, scouts, workers, and warriors. If you happen to encounter a worker or a warrior, you may get a painful pinch from their pinchers if you get too close. But if you end up on the wrong side of one of the queens, then you have a much, much worse fate in store for you. And it just so happened that the SCP-439 specimen that appeared in Bill Parham's bathroom that morning was visiting royalty. This 439 queen had selected her target. And now, it was time to move to the next part of the process. Initial Infiltration When Bill returned home from work, he was delighted to find that the gray earwig was nowhere to be seen. But that didn't mean it was gone. It was still there lurking. It just didn't want to be seen. After all, the real fun would happen after Bill went to bed. Once SCP-439 detects that its potential host has fallen into a deep sleep, it will crawl onto the person's body and into their mouth, which is exactly what it did to Bill. It feels like little more than a tickle in your throat, and you will have no idea that the tiny creature crawling down your windpipe and into the soft, warm tissue of your lungs spells your doom. Very few people wake up during this process, but even if they did, there's virtually nothing they could do. When Bill woke up, he was suffering from mild chest pains and shortness of breath, a symptom not uncommon in a number of respiratory ailments. He had no idea that the SCP-439 queen was already inside him. He got up and went about his day, trying to ignore the pain as it gradually grew worse and worse, feeling almost like something was moving inside his chest. He spent the whole day having to stop to let out a deep, hacking cough, but coughing didn't expel or change anything. He looked and felt so terrible that his boss let him go home early, hoping that Bill would be able to sleep off whatever illness he thought he had picked up. But over the next couple of days, his condition only worsened. The pain grew so excruciating he could barely move, and he was popping painkillers like Tic Tacs to no effect. He started running a dangerously high fever, his body trying in vain to fight back against its lethal intruder. He felt worse than he ever had in his life, but little did poor Bill know, the most terrible parts of the process were yet to come. Through anomalous means, an SCP-439 infection is able to induce fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, in its victims, which is typically a genetic disease that presents itself before the victim turns 10 years old. The condition is infamous for its primary symptom, turning muscle and other soft tissue into bone. 
slowly but surely paralyzing the victim and putting them into a state of unspeakable pain. This bone transformation process is known as ossification, and Bill was about to experience it firsthand. His pain increased as his mobility decreased, with more of his flesh becoming solid lumps of bone underneath the skin. Soon enough, all he knew was pain. It became so agonizing that he was delirious with it. He was drunk on pain. Even perceiving sunlight felt like being stabbed in the eyes. That's why, like all the other victims of SCP-439, he decided to conceal himself in a warm, dark place where no light could get to him. In Bill's case, of course, that place was his closet. He was hurting so bad that all he could do was curl up into the fetal position and weep as his muscles turned to bone and his body began to compact and shrink. He didn't even look like a human anymore. He was more like a ball, covered in a bone shell and filled with warm organs. That's when the queen started laying eggs among his organs. It wasn't long before there was a new brood of around 30,000 specimens living inside Bill's body. He was still very much alive, but there wasn't anything he could do about his situation. His muscles had long since turned to bone, and they had eaten large portions of his brain, leaving mainly the parts needed to keep his organs just barely functioning. After all, the colony still needs central heating. SCP-439 colonies have developed a perfect parasitic relationship with the human body. They even use the stomach inside the hive to pre-digest food into a liquid slurry that's easier for them to consume. The only loser in this situation is someone like Bill, who is forced to become the new home for the world's most nightmarish freeloaders. Eventually, when the colony becomes too big, a queen departs to start a new one, and the process repeats itself once more. It's enough to make you want to sleep with your mouth closed for the rest of your life. Oh, and we haven't even told you the worst part yet. Foundation scientists have conducted tests on some victims of SCP-439 and found that while the creatures do consume large parts of the brain, the parts they leave are capable of consciousness. That's right. Their victims remain aware of what's happening to them the whole time, even when they hardly seem human at all anymore. What actually finally kills the victims of SCP-439 isn't the bodily trauma. It's the starvation that sets in when the colony inevitably moves on. Did we just hear you cough? You might want to go get that checked out. Now go watch SCP-001 When Day Breaks and SCP-823 Carnival of Horrors for more terrifying SCPs that'll chill you to the bone.